أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode we spoke we began a discussion on the opposition tactics of Quraysh and we mentioned seven of them and inshallah in this episode we'll continue uh, that discussion we mentioned that in resisting in opposing the prophet Quraysh the pagans employed a number of tactics a number of methods the first of them was when the Prophet first began to recruit followers and the pagans started to feel that this religious movement was indeed a serious threat, they appealed to the highest authority among them. Because, the, because this is a tribal culture and Muhammad ibn Abdullah is a member of the clan of Bani Hashim, they followed the tribal protocol and the tribal protocol dictated that they approach the leader of that clan so the leader of that clan will deal with this nuance with, with this disturbance so they bring the issue to the attention of the prophet's uncle abu talib and they try to very gently uh, recommend to him that he reigns his nephew in. Of course, Abu Talib uh, does not uh, succumb to their demands. And then you see that they make a, treacher a treacherous offer to Abu Talib. As we discussed in our last episode, they essentially offer an exchange. They offer to trade the Prophet for a young man who Abu Talib could adopt as his own, a young noble man of Quraysh. And they essentially wanted a trade, that you give us your nephew so we can deal with him, so we can, we can kill him, and we'll compensate you for the loss of your nephew by giving you one of our own sons, you know, the, the most handsome and the most noble uh, young man among the Quraysh. Of course, Abu Talib uh, outrightly uh, rejects you know, such a preposterous offer. Among the, the tactics of the pagans, as is mentioned in the Quran, is that they also censored, they banned the public recitation of the Holy Quran. You see on a number of occasions, some of the companions of the Prophet, they get physically assaulted for reciting the Quran in public. You know, one of the, the names that jumps out is the, the companion of the Prophet, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who is originally from Yemen, so he doesn't have the backing of a powerful clan, a powerful tribe. He recites the Quran in public and he is physically uh, assaulted. The Prophet ﷺ is also mocked. The believers are mocked. They're ridiculed. They're made fun of. This is one of the things that they do. So they bully. They physically, they verbally abuse the Prophet and a number of his companions. We mentioned that the Quraysh also engaged in character assassination. They called the Prophet Majnoon. They called him insane. They said that he was a sahir, he was a magician, that he was possessed by a jinn. And they also called him a poet, that this, is, this man is nothing but a poet. So they tried to damage the Prophet's character uh, to prevent people from listening to him and to hearing his admonishments. They also demanded flashy miracles. As we mentioned in our previous episode, they continuously asked the Prophet to produce new miracles. And the motivation 
for this request was not their desire to know the truth or to objectively uh, evaluate the Prophet's truthfulness. This was simply their way of expressing their defiance. This was uh, an, a manifestation of their, their stubbornness. So their request for a miracle was not because of their desire to know the truth. It was to simply challenge the Prophet and to stump him. The Qur'an also mentions that in Surah Al-Kafirun that they try to come to a compromise. That, okay, if you refuse to uh, abandon this new religion, then let us come to a compromise. We will be Muslims one day and we will practice according to your religious teachings. And then the next day you will worship idols. You will, you will follow the pagan rituals. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an makes it very clear that there is no compromise when it comes to monotheism. As the Qur'an says, لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ For you is your religion, and for me is my religion. So this is what we covered in our previous episode. Another opposition tactic of Quraysh was... Of course, the pagans were not as familiar with the ancient prophets as the Jews were. So, some of the so Quraysh sent emissaries to Yathrib to Medina to consult with the Jews, saying to them that there is a, a man who is claiming to be a prophet in Mecca, and we know that you are a people who have experience with prophets and messengers, can you give us some questions that could potentially stump this man and expose him as a liar? So the Jews of Medina supplied the pagans with questions that they could ask the prophet to assess whether or not he is a genuine prophet of God. So, among the questions that they ask the Prophet, for example, the Jews say to the, the emissaries that, you know, ask him about the family of Ishaq, ask him about Yaqub, ask him about Yusuf, you know, what happened to the, what is the story of these Jewish prophets, these Hebrew prophets? And you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, He reveals Surah Yusuf as an answer to the question that's posed about the family of Ya'qub. Uh, they ask uh, the Prophet ﷺ about Dhil Qarnayn. You know, tell us about this figure in history known as Dhil Qarnayn. Uh, they also ask the Prophet about uh, the reality of the spirit. You know, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ Say that they ask you a lot about the spirit, about the ruh. Say to them that the spirit is from the command of my Lord, and you have been you have you have been given very little knowledge about it. So many of these verses in the Quran that are that are uh, prefixed with the phrase وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ and they ask you. These verses typically, generally, they refer to those questions that were directed to Rasulullah in order to, to stump him, to, make, to expose that he is a false messenger of God. So the motive behind many of these questions was to pose difficult questions to the Prophet, to embarrass him and to convince people that he's not actually a prophet of God. But, in, but as you see, the Qur'an with the revelation of these verses and these chapters answers uh, these questions in uh, elaborate detail. Now, in addition to the, the questions, the difficult questions that were posed to the Prophet ﷺ by the pagans, but through the Jews in Medina and in some of the surrounding areas. In addition to that, one of the most powerful, one of the most effective opposition tactics of the pagans was their physical torture 
of the early Muslims in Mecca. So the, the pagans, when you read the books of the seerah, you see that the pagans, the mushrikeen, they tormented the early Muslims. They ridiculed those with status. So really no one was fully immune. Those who had the backing of a powerful tribe, at the very least they were ridiculed. So they ridiculed those with status. They imposed, they imposed an economic boycott on those with money. So if you were a wealthy Muslim, they may have not, you know, they're not going to physically torture you, especially if, you, if you're a person of status, but they'll place economic sanctions on you. You know, people, no one will do business with you if you identify as a Muslim. So they were ridiculed. Those companions who had money, they experienced some, some financial difficulties. The pagans refused to do business with them. And the, the poor and the weak Sahaba, the poor and the weak companions of the Prophet, were frequently physically assaulted. Now, as we've mentioned time and time again, in, in Arab society, in Arabia at this time, your tribe was your protection. So those who had tribal bonds were somewhat protected. They had that layer of insurance. So the Prophet ﷺ, being uh, from Quraysh, he had uh, this protection, especially because you know his, uh, his uncle Abu Talib is the chief of Quraysh. He is considered the most prominent uh, figure among the Quraysh. So the Prophet has that level of protection. Some of the other companions of the Prophet who belonged to uh, powerful tribes, they enjoyed that protection from physical violence. But of course, the slaves, the, the slaves and even ex-slaves did not have this, uh, this type of protection. Just to give you an idea of how severe the physical torture was, uh, Sa'id ibn, Ju Sa ibn Jubayr, who is one of the uh, one of the tabi'in? He is one of the students of uh, Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet. So Sa'id asks Sa'id ibn Jubayr. He asks Ibn Abbas, "What was the torture of the Sahaba in the early days?" You know, you, you, they'd hear these stories about how difficult it was to be Muslim in the early period in Mecca, in Mecca especially. You know, was it really that bad or is it exaggerated? Ibn Abbas, he says that the believers were so severely tortured, they were starved, they were even deprived of water, that those who were physically abused, namely those slaves or those ex-slaves, they were so severely tortured that some of them could not even sit up straight because of the pain. So they were, they were beaten pretty brutally. And it was so bad that when they were asked by the mushrikeen, is Allah and Al-Uzza your God? So these are some of the, the main gods, the main idols that were worshipped by the pagans. So when they were asked, are they your gods? Many of them said, yes, Allah and Al-Uzza are my gods. Just to uh, get rid of the torture, just to protect themselves from further torture. It, you know, it's very rare that you have someone like you know, Bilal ibn Rabah who is willing to endure the worship and refuses to denounce his faith, even under uh, torture. But many of the early companions, they did. They, they praised the idols to, uh, to protect themselves uh, from the violence. Now, of course, Islam allows a person to speak uh, words, to speak blasphemous words if you're being tortured to death, as long as your heart remains upon the truth, as long as your heart has recognized and submitted to the truth, you are permitted to denounce your faith, 
to speak words of blasphemy in order to save your life, in order to protect yourself. And as we've mentioned, Abu Jahl was one of the main perpetrators of this uh, violence against the early Muslims. In fact, when Abu Jahl would hear that someone uh, became Muslim, you know, it's, it's almost as though he, he would keep an ear out. He would pay attention to see if there are any new converts and he would pursue them. He would chase after them. If a person became Muslim and Abu Jahl found out and he would typically find out because he had eyes and ears all over Mecca, he would, if it was a person of status, of you know, who's a respected person, a prominent person in Meccan society, he would scold them, he would ridicule them, and he would say, he would taunt them and say that, you know, you've abandoned the religion of your father. You know, do you think that you're better than your father? So he would, uh, he would berate them in the streets. He would say, you've, you've lost your mind. You're a person of poor judgment and you know, you're going to pay the price for this. If the, if the convert was a merchant, if they were a trader, they would say that we're never, you're never going to see any uh, trade again. We're not going to do any business deals with you and we'll force you into back bankruptcy. So there was economic pressure. So imagine you're a business owner and you become Muslim in Mecca and you're minding your own business. You know, you're not provoking the mushrikeen. Abu Jahl comes into your shop and says that you're Muslim now. Okay, I'm going to make sure that there's not a single customer that walks into your shop. Your suppliers, people that you do business with, Abu Jahl is a very influential person. He says, I'm going to ensure that all your contracts are canceled that I will ensure that you starve. Imagine that type of pressure. This was, this was what it was like, brothers and sisters, to be a Muslim during the early Meccan period. And of course, if it wasn't a, a merchant and it wasn't someone of status, if it was just a slave or an ex-slave or someone who did not belong to uh, the tribe of Quraysh, you know, they were someone from a far land, a distant land. If they were weak, he would beat them. And he would also encourage others to join him. To, he would provoke others to physically attack uh, the convert. Now in the tribal system, each clan was responsible for torturing its own. So for example, if there is someone who becomes Muslim from the clan of uh, Banu Makhzum, for example. It would be expected of them to torture a member of their tribe who became Muslim. So they would have to self-police the members of their tribes. So if there's a person from you know, the Umayyads who would join Islam, the Umayyads, the chiefs, they would discipline and punish that person. So so, so there was no public prison. If someone became Muslim, the clan itself would imprison that person in their own homes. They would starve them and they would make them lie on the, the searing hot sand. They would whip them. And in some cases, the tribe would actually kill a person for becoming Muslim. And we have some examples of the Sahaba, the early companions of the Prophet, who were tortured. And I'll mention uh, a few of them, and, uh, and then inshallah uh, we'll conclude. Now, of course, one of the most prominent early companions of the Prophet, and I'm, I'm sure you know the images of, of Bilal ibn Rabah are ingrained in our minds because of you know, some of the movies that we, sh we saw growing up, like The Message, and we saw his resilience and how steadfast he was. Bilal ibn Rabah was one of the early converts to Islam. And you can just imagine how difficult life was for Bilal. Life was difficult for Bilal before he became Muslim. 
He was an Abyssinian slave. He was from Habasha. And he was owned by a very prominent man by the name of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. When Bilal joins the Prophet, when he declares his Islam, Umayyah tied a rope around his neck. And I, I, don't, I want you to understand this, brothers and sisters. A slave is a person's property. So when Umayyah ibn Khalaf is torturing Bilal, he's essentially damaging, at least in his mind and in the minds of people, he's damaging his most, his most important piece of property. Some, a slave was worth more than a house. A slave was a very valuable piece of property. And because they, they provide a very valuable service. So for someone to dis damage their property, it shows you how angry and how much hate and how much vitriol they had towards Islam and the Muslims. So Umayyah ties a rope around the neck of Bilal. And, and what does he say? I mean, look at, look at the, the pain and the hardship and the abuse that Bilal endured. Umayyah, he ties a rope around the neck of Bilal and he told his kids to run around in the mountains and drag him. So imagine the children of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, they drag the neck, they drag the rope and they pull his neck and they just go out and play. And he's being dragged through the mountains and the fields all day. You can just imagine what happened to the skin around his neck. Brutally tortured. So there's an element of humiliation. There's the physical suffering, the physical pain. On another occasion, Umayy ibn Khalaf, he left Bilal thirsty for the entire day. He did not give him a single drop of water for the entire day. Imagine, no food and no water for an entire day. And on top of that, that enough weakens you. Being deprived of water and food would be enough to weaken you. In addition to that, in addition to the deprivation of food and water, he lays Bilal on the hot sand. Some of the companions, they say that during those days when Bilal was being laid on the hot sand, the sand was so hot that you could cook meat on the rocks. If you put the meat, a piece of meat on the sand or on the, the meat will begin to cook. That's how hot the sand was. So he lays Bilal ibn Rabah on his back directly. His skin would be in contact with the hot sand and not that's not all that would be that would be enough torture he would also put a hot boulder on top of his chest and what is what does umayy ibn khalaf want he wants him to just denounce he wants him to praise the idols he wants him to denounce allah and his messenger but he doesn't so you see that some companions they, there was a threshold. There was a pain threshold that they met and they couldn't handle or tolerate anymore. But Bilal ibn Rabah, was, he was like a piece of iron. They just couldn't break him. Umayyah, he took Bilal out in the midday sun. He threw him on the hot desert sand and then ordered a hot boulder to, to be placed on his chest. And he said to him, you will remain like this until you die or deny Muhammad and worship Allah wal Uzza. Now imagine, put yourself in this position. I think you and I, within a few seconds, will praise, will do sujood to, to Umayyah ibn Khalid. We'll say, I'll do sujood to you and your idols. Just please release me from this torture. He tells him that you're going to, either you die with this boulder on your chest, or you relinquish your faith. And the famous response of Bilal was, Ahadun Ahad. 
He's one. Allah is one. Now, some narrations mention that uh, in the meanwhile, Abu Bakr, who lived in the area, walked by and said, Do you not fear God regarding this poor man? Until when will you continue? How will you continue to torture him? Umayyah said, You are the one who corrupted him, so you save him. And some narrations, uh, and Abu Bakr said, I will, I have a black slave who is stronger than he and follows your religion. I will exchange him for this man. And Umayyah accepted. Now, <clears throat> we also find that in the books of Sirah, that Umar ibn al-Khattab, before his conversion to Islam, he actually was one of the torturers of the early Muslims. Umar ibn al-Khattab tortured a slave girl from Adi, from, from that uh, uh, family. She was a black slave girl who, who became Muslim. And he beat her so severely, but she, she never, she, she was strong. He beat her and she remained strong. And the narrations say the only reason why Umar ibn al-Khattab stopped beating her is because he got bored. And he told her mockingly that I, I beg your pardon. I only stopped because I got bored. I was beating you and beating you and beating you, but it didn't have any effect. So I, I stopped because I became bored. This was the type of torture that the early Muslims endured. Now, of course, one of the most famous families among the early Muslims was the family of Ammar ibn Yasir. So Ammar and his parents, I mean, what a blessed family. You know, typically it's you know, one or two people, a person joins Islam. Here an entire family becomes Muslim. Ammar and his parents, Yasir and Sumayya, they join Islam very early on. And they were tortured by Banu Makhzum. It's a very powerful tribe. And of course, Ammar and his parents, they, were, uh, they belonged to the class of, of slaves. So they didn't have a tribe uh, to protect them. They tied them down. So Ammar and his parents and even Ammar's uh, brother uh, was tortured. They tied them down on the hot sand and Sumayya resisted and became, of course, she refused to relinquish her faith. And Sumayya, the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir, becomes the first shahida in the history of Islam. So the first martyr in the Islamic tradition is not a man. It's actually a woman and it's the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir, what a noble woman who, I mean, look at the, the faith of these people. They were willing to die instead of denounce their faith in Allah Azza wa Jal and in His Messenger. Now, Ammar was tortured so badly that the scars from the torture that he fa faced, and Ammar ibn Yasir was probably in his late teens at the time. He was, he was a young man, or maybe in his early 20s. The scars that he received from that day remained with him for the rest of his life. So you can just imagine how badly he was beaten. Now, Ammar ibn Yasir, he ended up recanting his faith. He denounced his faith under taqiyya, of course, you know, to, to save himself from being tortured to death, he praises uh, the idols. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals Surah An-Nahl, verse 106. And this is a famous verse in the Quran about Ammar ibn Yasir. مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِمْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَضَبٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Whoever rejects God after having believed, of course they are 
punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except him who was forced while his heart was solid, solidly in faith. This is a description of the faith of Ammar ibn Yasu. But those who let unbelief into their hearts, then the wrath of God is upon them and they will have a terrible punishment. So when you look at Ammar ibn Yasur, the story goes that when he's tortured, his parents are, are killed. Imagine, you're, you see your parents tortured to death in front of your eyes. And he praises the idols to save his life. He goes to the Prophet. Imagine, he just witnessed the murder of his parents. He goes to the Prophet. And the only thing that he is worried about is, Ya Rasulullah, I praise the idols. What is going to happen to me? What is my condition? Did I lose my iman? Imagine, someone loses their parents and their main concern is their deen. This was Ammar ibn Yasr. And the Prophet says that, that Allah has revealed a verse in the Quran about you and if they torture you, do the same thing. Meaning that, protect yourself. Utter a word of blasphemy in order to save yourself from death. Now another early companion that's mentioned is Suhaib al-Rumi. Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi. When you look at the early Meccan period, his name is mentioned among the early converts. He, he, he was basically in the same batch of early, convert, early converts as you know, Bilal and Ammar. So he was among the, the companions of the Prophet and the first Muslims who accepted Islam at around the same time as Ammar ibn Yasir. Now, he was known as Ar-Rumi, Suhaib ibn Sinan Ar-Rumi, which means Suhaib the Roman. Now, of course, he was not of, uh, of, of Roman lineage. He was originally from Iraq. His, his origin is from Iraq. And he was captured as a boy and he was sent to Rome. He was captured. And he, he grew up in Rome. And, and therefore, he was not fluent in Arabic. He actually was very fluent in, in Latin. But he knew that he was an Arab and he eventually fled Rome and he was sold uh, as a slave to Abdullah ibn Jud'an who was the man who had the, the Hilf al-Fudul pact, the, the, the coalition of justice when the Prophet was in his 20s. This was that man. And uh, ibn Jud'an, he was known to be a very merciful person to his slaves and And therefore you see that the torture that Suhaib experienced was, was not nearly uh, like the torture of the other companions. Uh, he was basically a business manager for Abdullah ibn Jud'an uh, because he had the ability to read and write. And he actually became wealthy. And Ibn Jud'an uh, mentioned in his will that if I die, I want Suhaib to be uh, free. Now, the reason why I mention this personality is when you look at uh, the Sunni narrative of the, of the seerah, you see that this person is mentioned as a great companion of the Prophet, an early convert to Islam, who endured some degree of suffering in Mecca. And in the Sunni tradition, Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi is considered one of the elites. However, in the Shi'i tradition, the Shia have reservations about him. Now, he participated in all of the battles. That's, that's agreed upon. He had a very close relationship with the second Khalifa. To such an extent 
that when Umar ibn al-Khattab was ill, Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi was leading the prayers on his behalf. And after Umar ibn al-Khattab died, Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi performed Salatul Janaza on him. So he was very close to the opponents of the, the Ahlul Bayt. And furthermore, after the assassination of Uthman, Suhaib does not give bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So here we see a very clear indication that he did not have that affinity towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. He did not have a close relationship with Ali ibn Abi Talib. And therefore, in the Shi'i tradition, he's not considered uh, a praise a praiseworthy companion. In fact, we have an explicit riwayah, an explicit narration from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, where Imam al-Sadiq mentions two companions of the Prophet. One, and, and they, they joined Islam around the same time. Imam al-Sadiq says, and this is mentioned in Rijal al-Kashi, which is known as a book of Rijal, a book of hadith about the narrators of, of hadith to get an idea of uh, who they were and whether and whether they could be relied upon. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, كَانَ بِلَالٌ عَبْدًا صَالِحًا So here is an endorsement for Bilal from Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, he says, Bilal was a righteous servant. For Imam al-Sadiq, to call you Abdan Salihan, you can only imagine the Iman, the faith of Bilal. Wakana Suhaib, Imam Sadiq says, Wakana Suhaibu Abdun Abdusu. Suhaib was an evil servant. Wakana Yabki ala Umar. Suhaib, in Rijal al Kashi, Imam Sadiq says, Suhaib was not a, a good servant of God. Again, his intentions early on may have been pure. He probably joined Islam with conviction. But later on, he aligns himself with those who harm the family of the Prophet. He does not stand with Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Imam al-Sadiq says, وَكَانَ يَبْكِي عَلَى عُمَرِ he, he wept so much over Umar ibn al-Khattab. He was given you know, preferential treatment under Umar ibn al-Khattab, who he, sh he should have cried for Fatima al zahra for what happened to the family of the Prophet, but he cried over the second uh, Khalifa. Number five, and this is one of, this man was one of the early converts to Islam, and he was one of the greatest companions of the Prophet. Khabbab ibn al-Arat, this is a name that we should know. He was among the first people who believed in Rasulullah and he embraced Islam. And there's a difference of opinion about uh, when he joined Islam. Some say that he was the sixth person to join Islam in the house of Indar al-Arqam. Others say he was the 10th, 11th, or the 20th. The point is, he was one of the early uh, companions and he is among the first Muslims who made their conversion to Islam public. Many companions concealed their conversion to Islam. Khabbab was among those who was open about his conversion to Islam. Now Khabbab was an Arab. He was an Arab slave. Now of course, sl slaves were tortured across the board. But an Arab slave was treated a little bit better than slaves of different ethnic backgrounds. So the way that, so Bilal was treated the worst because Bilal was an Ethiopian slave. Khabab was also tortured, but not in the way that, uh, so typically Arab slaves enjoyed a little bit better treatment than non-Arab slaves. Now Khabab's master, was a female. His slave owner was a female. And 
again, I mean, this goes to show you that whether your slave master was male or female, in the early days of Islam, both male male slaves, slave owners, and female slave owners were equally uh, uh, cruel to their slaves. Now, when she found out that Khabbab converted, she rounded up a gang, a group of thugs together to beat him up. And she didn't stop there. You know, Khabbab, by trade, he was, a, he was a sword maker. You know, what we would call maybe a blacksmith. She used the iron that he would use to make swords and she ironed his back. Allahu Akbar. Imagine, brothers and sisters. She lays him down. She gets a bunch of thugs to beat him. And they hold him down and she irons his back. Imagine someone ironing your back. The flesh is literally melting off of your back. This is what Khabbab endured. And Amir al muminin Khabbab was one of those companions of the Prophet who was praised by Ali ibn Abi Talib. After the death of Khabbab, and Khabbab died, I believe, in the 37th year after Hijrah. So he died about three years before Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Khabbab died, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, and you can find this statement in Nahjul Balagha, in saying uh, 43 of Nahjul Balagha, Amir al muminin he says, Yarhamullahu Khabbab ibn al Arat. May Allah have mercy on Khabbab ibn al Arat. And Amir al muminin his dua is mustajab. When Amir al muminin says, May Allah have mercy on such and such person, you know that Allah is going to have mercy on such and such person. This is the dua of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the dua of the commander of the faithful. Now why is the Imam asking Allah to have mercy on him? The Imam says, فَلَقَدْ أَسْلَمَ رَاغِبًا He accepted Islam eagerly. He had so much passion for Islam. فَلَقَدْ أَسْلَمَ رَاغِبًا وَهَاجَرَ طَائِعًا And he emigrated obediently, willingly. You know, some were reluctant about going on hijrah because they had you know family ties but he he did hijrah in perfect obedience to the prophet and he was content with mere substance khabab was a person of contentment he was pleased with whatever allah azza wa jal gave him he was not uh, he, he did not have his eye on the dunya. He was content. He was satisfied with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. And he was pleased with God. And this is not easy, brothers and sisters. Some of us, when we get sick, when we lose money, when, when we go through trials and tribulations, we're not happy with what Allah is putting us through. We're patient. You know, we might... Endure the bitterness of, but he was pleased with whatever Allah, with whatever situation Allah put him in. And he lived fighting for God. He was a true mujahid, fought in the battles of Islam, fought alongside Ali ibn Abi. His entire war, life was spent in the battlefields, defending uh, Islam. Inshallah, brothers and sisters, in our next. Uh, episode will speak uh, about one of the most important events during uh, of the Meccan period which is the Hijrah the, the the emigration of the early Muslims to Abyssinia so we'll speak about that uh, in detail in our next episode uh, thank you so much brothers and sisters for tuning in uh, to listen to another episode of the life of of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
عليكم السلام ورحمة الله Yes, ahsan. Being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that I'll give you a, an example. Let's say that God forbid you get sick and you go through you suffer and you go through a lot of difficulties. A person who's pleased with Allah is not going to say that, you know, it would have been better if this didn't happen to me. If I lose my job, someone whose patient says, you know, I'm, I'm not happy that I'm, I lost my job, but, you know, inshallah things will change for me. A person who's pleased with Allah, they're similar to Ayyub. Whether he, he has children, whether they, what, no matter what happens, he always has Alhamdulillah on his tongue and he means it. You know, it's one thing to say, you know, when, when bad things happen to us, we, you know, we say, you know, inshallah khair. Inshallah khair, there, there's khair in it. We might say this, but we don't really feel pleased in our hearts. So being pleased with God means that you you are satisfied you are happy in fact you are happy with any life circumstance that Allah puts you in most people you know when, when Allah there's and what's beautiful is that when Allah speaks about Jannah everyone is going to be pleased with Allah in Jannah رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن it's one of the in Jannah all mu'mineen are pleased with Allah because Allah is providing them with everything that they want. The key is to be pleased with Allah in dunya, meaning that you are happy with whatever Allah decrees. You actually feel that happiness in your heart. And how do you get to a level where you feel the happiness in your heart? Is because you know, you have yaqeen, that Allah Azza wa Jal does everything in your best interest. So to be pleased with Allah is essentially to affirm that no matter what happens to me, it's in my best interest. And this is assuming that someone is following the Sharia. Ah. If you're obedient to Allah, if you have taqwa, if you have sincerity, then you should be happy with whatever happens to you. So this is the meaning of being pleased with Allah. You are sad, you are happy about whatever Allah decrees. It's not that you're just patient and you're enduring and you're hoping things change. You're, you say that I'm happy whether I have money or I don't have money. Of course, you ask Allah to give you, to give you rizq, to give you health. However, whatever the outcome is, you're pleased. Because you know that if you end up becoming sick, if Allah doesn't give you health, there's hikmah, there's wisdom behind it. It's in your best interest. Allah is providing you an opportunity to get closer to Him. So being pleased with Allah is to be happy, to feel joy in your heart about whatever Allah decrees. Because you know that everything that He does is for your own growth. It's, it's in your best interest. Now, of course, Allah is pleased when you strive. So part of being pleased with Allah is also to use everything that Allah has given you, to use your resources. But, the, but what we have to pay attention to is that after I exhaust all of my effort, I am pleased with the outcome. Now, of course, if I, if, if I don't work hard, I can't say that I'm pleased that Allah Azza wa did not give me rizq. No. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because here, you not having rizq, you for suffering financially, is a result of your lack of hard work. 
when you strive, when you, and you know if you're doing your best. You know, ala nafsi basir. You know yourself. If you are genuinely doing your best and you're striving, you should be happy about whatever whatever the outcome is because you leave it to Allah. So it's not, it's not just patient. It's not that you have a, a desired outcome and if it's not that desired outcome, you're upset. You're frustrated. No, you want to get to a level where you're pleased. You are pleased with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. So one of the unique things about the, the Arabic language is that one word can have two opposite meanings. So in Arabic, Mawla means master and Mawla also means slave. So there are some words in the Arabic language that have... Uh, that have these uh, these double meanings, and and the way that you know what the meaning is is by context. So so the word the word mola has many meanings, but one of the most prominent meanings is that it, it refers to a slave, and it can also refer to a uh, a master. You know, e- even for example, when uh, in Arabic we have something called tasghir, which is and this is something that we that I, I think maybe last Ramadan I taught a course in in Arabic grammar and we covered this. Tasghir is the diminutive, uh, it's a diminutive noun. So for example, in Arabic, you can turn a word into a diminutive form and it can either be used as a term of endearment or it can, it can be used to insult someone. So... For example, the word, you have the word Rajul, and then you have Rujail. Rujail is the diminutive form of Rajul. Now, when you say Rujail, it can mean my dear, a dear affectionate man, Rujail, a beloved man, or it can mean a small man. So here, the same word can be used to express love, and it can be used to insult someone. Similarly, the word mawla, it, uh, it, refers, it can refer to a master and it can refer to a slave. 